Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take live comments and questions from our viewers watching the show live. But what if you're one of those people who watches our channel one of the other 22 hours during the day, and you've got a comment, question, thought, observation, whatever that you want me or sometimes Rob to read off? Well, that's why we do Mailbag, because you can send in a question for Mailbag anytime, 24-7, using the tip link that's down in the description below. You can just click on it there, or you can enter it in, that in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll begin your comment or question read on Mailbag if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on our show. And of course, you'll be supporting our channel at the same time. And all of us at the John Campion channel, thank you guys so much for your support. Well, it is Sunday, and I told you guys we'd be doing another mailbag this weekend, so that's what we're doing right now. So let's not waste any time and get right to it. We're going to get things started off here with one sent in from Geek Girl 1980 who writes the following. Hey guys, I saw recently that a judge denied Disney's motion to throw out a lawsuit against Disneyland over the Dream Key Pass. The person suing, suing claims that they were misled about the park reservation system. Do you think they will win? Bring on the filthy. Well, I mean, here's the thing, uh, Geek Girl. I have no idea. I'm not familiar with the case. I don't know all the ins and outs. I don't know all the details. I'm not familiar with this at all. What I will say, though, however, is a lot of people misunderstand the idea that, okay, so Disney brought a motion to dismiss and that got rejected. That does not mean that Disney's going to lose the case, though. Not necessarily. It doesn't mean they're going to win. I'm just saying it doesn't mean they're going to lose. A lot of times, a motion to dismiss is brought to a court prior to a trial really getting started. And quite often, those motions to dismiss are rejected. Sometimes they work, but they often don't. But that doesn't really give you any insight as to whether or not they're going to win the case. Or not. It just means that the judge feels there's enough there to at least have the trial, right? I'm, I'm oversimplifying it massively, but just generally that. A good example of that is in the recent like Johnny Depp UK trial, right? The son uh, or the side of Amber Heard, the son brought a motion to dismiss the case and it got denied. It got rejected. Now, of course, they still went on to win the trial, Amber Heard and the son. They went on and won that trial anyway, even though their motion to dismiss got rejected. All it means is, is that it doesn't really mean a lot if that emotion like that gets rejected. So just because Disney lost that that uh, dismissal doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose the case. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but I have no opinion about it because like I said, Geek Girl, I don't know anything about it, unfortunately. All right, thanks for saying that in. Next up, we've got Willow who sends in like a $50 uh, tip. Thank you so much, Willow, for supporting our channel on that level. Willow's been one of our longtime supporters around here, as a matter of fact. Thank you, Willow. And Willow writes... I would like to send my best wishes to John's mom and hope she has a full and speedy recovery. If John is reading this, and I am, uh, which kid in the photo of your dad that you recently posted is you? I'm dying to know. All right, thanks for sending that. I'll tell you what, I'll see if I can, just so you guys know which one we're talking about here. Let me see if I can bring up that, uh, that photo in question. Okay, there's the photo. Let me see if I can bring it up here. So there's the photo. And you can't see the whole thing, unfortunately, because uh, it's getting cut off here a little bit. But on the photo, the uh, the kid with the mop hair, that's me. <laughs> that's me in the blue checker, blue and white checkerboard shirt. Uh, there is me. Sitting right beside me on my dad's lap is, my, is the youngest of our family. That's my brother, Rob. On my dad's other lap is my sister, Sandy. And then sitting beside my dad on the other side, who is not I can't get her in the picture, unfortunately, right now, uh, is my sister, who's the second oldest in the family, uh, Heather. So I am the oldest. And then I have after me. So there was me, then Heather was born, then Sandy, then Rob. And uh, that's my dad sitting there in the middle. Thank you so much for asking about that. And that's me. And Willow, thank you again for supporting us on that level. That's really generous of you. Thank you so much. All right. Next up, uh, we've got Jerome who writes, like Daenerys, uh, there are Walter White fans who didn't see him as a villain slash evil, even either when though, um, try this again. There are Walter White fans who didn't see him as a villain slash evil either, even though he was responsible for the deaths of innocents. He was also a jerk and he eventually had enough power, uh, enough money, but he kept pursuing more power. Your thoughts. I mean, Breaking Bad is a different thing, right? Breaking, uh, like the difference 
we've talked about this before. One of the big differences between the two characters is in Breaking Bad with Walter, the name of the show is Breaking Bad. I mean, the show always told the viewers from the beginning, this guy is Breaking Bad. He's he's going to be a villain. He's going to be a bad guy. And like a lot of villains, he sees himself as just misunderstood or he tried to do the right thing or, or whatever. But ultimately, the, the show was the show. But, you know, people view their view characters in different ways. It's just like anything else with movies or TV shows. Like characters will all hit us in different ways. Like some people look at Boromir in Lord of the Rings as being like just an absolute jerk. Me, he's my favorite character in all of literature because there's a great redemption arc there, right? So it, it all depends. Everybody looks at characters different, including characters from Game of Thrones, including characters from Breaking Bad, and it's just their own experience. But yeah, I mean, the show itself is, I mean, it's called Breaking Bad, so it's pretty clear. All right, next up. The Robo Producer writes, Yo, John, you were talking about how film sequels should maybe recap the last film. I remember that a long time ago. Like, I don't think I said they should do that, but I, I mean, maybe I'm not remembering right, but I thought I said, like, it may not be a bad idea if, you know, how a lot of TV shows, an episode starts with previously on our show and they give a little bit of recap just to bring the audience up to speed. I thought, well, maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea for a movie that's part of a franchise or a sequel. Anyway, uh, much like many of the TV shows do. This worked well in the Friday the 13th saga. It's a great tool if used right. I don't know what what bringing the filthy means. <laughs> Explain. Um, I, I'm just going to do a quick version. Uh, bring on the filthy. Many years ago, I was asked a question about an upcoming movie called Fifty Shades of Grey based on the book, and would it be rated X or rated, would it be or would it be rated NC-17 or would it be rated R? I said it's going to be rated R. I said, don't get me wrong. I love the filthy. Bring on the filthy, uh, blah, blah. And ever since I said that, it just caught on and people just started ending all their messages to me with bring on the filthy. So there you go. All right. Thanks for that, Robo. Next up, Tim writes, hey, John and team, I personally love to use the long trailers at the beginning of movies to eat my popcorn. And once I see the AMC trailer start, I have time to get up and refill before the movie starts. Just in time to watch Nicole Kidman. Hope it stays. God, Tim, I mean, God bless you if that's how you feel. I couldn't disagree with you more. I, in, in all dead seriousness, um, Ann and I went to a uh, Regal Theater last night. Not because we were seeing a movie. We were just going out for dinner. But we went out of our way to go to this Regal Cinema. That's just a little bit further away from us in the AMC. And I actually went in to talk to a manager there about the Regal Unlimited plan. I am dead serious. I am honestly thinking about canceling my AMC A-list and stopping going to AMC theaters and changing, because AMC has been my movie theater of choice for a lot of years. But I'm actually considering it because of that Nicole Kidman ad. And you might say, and I get it, you might say, really, you change theaters because of like a, a one minute thing. Here's the thing. I go to a lot of movies and you guys already know that one of my big, big irritating points of going to the movies is that a seven o'clock movie doesn't actually start for a half hour after that, right? That is a fucking idiotic thing that these movie theaters do. You fucking morons. You want, the people will come to the movies if you give them a good experience. You're off to the wrong start when a movie doesn't start till half hour after you tell them it's going to start. Fuck you. Anyway, um, but it gets especially irritating when I sit through 25 minutes of trailers and then it's not over. Then they got to show you go out and buy a soda at AMC. And then they got to run a spot for a joint A-list at AMC. And then instead of just starting the movie, they have to run that fucking Nicole Kidman spot again. And I love Nicole Kidman, but a commercial that's telling me I should come to a place that I'm already at. I'm, like, why are you show like they've started running those commercials on TV and that's great. It's a great commercial to run on TV because you're telling people who are not at AMC theaters, hey, you should come to AMC theaters. It is the height of idiocy that they play a trailer saying, hey, come to AMC theaters. Well, forgive me if I'm wrong, but am I am I not already sitting right fucking here? So like instead of starting a movie that is already technically 28 minutes late, instead of starting the movie, you just play another commercial. It fucking drives me crazy and it irritates me so much. I've now had to watch this commercial like 85 times. I, I'm actually thinking about changing movie theaters. I, I, I really am. Now, I'm 
not 100% sure we're going to do that. There's a lot I like about AMC theaters, but I'm glad it works for you, Tim. God bless you. But it's it's irritating enough to me that I'm actually thinking about changing movie theater chains. Anyway, uh, next up, the Axe of Zaslov writes, Hey, John and team, I'll finally be able to see everything everywhere all at once. Nice. Best movie of the year uh, for my birthday tomorrow. Nice. I know you aren't a fan of the Star Wars prequels, but I remember going to see Attack of the Clones on my birthday 20 years ago. Yes, I am not a fan of the Star Wars prequels, but I can sit down and have a conversation with anybody about certain things about the prequels I really like. Um, and, you know, just because I don't like them, doesn't mean other people shouldn't like them. And, you know, I, I I know a number of people who are Star Wars fans where the prequels were actually their entry point into them. Now, in my opinion, they're still piling heaps of dog shit. They are absolutely horrendously offensive to the human race kind of awful movies. But that's just my take. And there are still things about them that I like. Like, I will argue with anybody about how great I think the pod races are. I think the pod race scenes, the sound design, they're thrilling, they're exciting. Obviously, the Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, Darth Maul lightsaber fight is like one of the best lightsaber fights ever, I think, in Star Wars canon. I don't care what some people say. I love watching Yoda have lightsaber fights. I mean, so I can sit down and have real good discussions with people about the things I actually like about the prequels, even though, yeah, for me overall, they're terrible. But, um, I mean, other people have, uh, there are some people who have really pleasant memories and fond memories. You know what? Whatever works for you, I celebrate that. And if that's what brought you into Star Wars fandom, then that is awesome. And I'm glad you get to have that kind of memory about it, man. All right. Thanks for sharing that, Axis Aslav. Next, Casey Mack writes, Hey, John and crew, did you see the trailer for 3,000 Years of Longing? Uh, looks like a crazy ride. It stars Tilda Swinton, Idris Elba, and, the, and it's directed by George Miller. I really liked Mad Max Fury Road, so it will be interesting to see what this brings. I'll tell you what, this is a crazy trailer, but I kind of dig it. So for those of you who don't know anything about 3,000 Years of Longing, Tilda Swinton plays an older lady and she's just kind of at a certain place in her life. And then she comes across this, this old antique. It looks kind of like a lamp, an oil lamp, right? But it doesn't look like the Aladdin classic one. And I, I can't, she ends up rubbing it and a gin comes out and it's a gin played by Idris Elba who says you get wishes now and, and they start getting into these philosophical discussions. And I think we start looking throughout history of the different people, the jinn have come across. And I'll tell you what, while it looks kind of freaky bonkers at first, by the end of that trailer, I was really enjoying what I was watching and I am quite excited to see 3000 years of longing. Thanks for bringing that up. Casey. Okay. Next up, we've got another one from Casey Mack who writes one last thing. I agree with Aaron that there is a lot of stuff coming at us as far as streaming and movies go. We have Stranger Things, Obi-Wan, The Boys coming in the next three weeks, and I'm still trying to catch up on other stuff too. I mean, look, it is it is a first world problem, and it is, as Robert would say, an embarrassment of riches. There is so much good stuff to watch that it's just simply impossible to keep up with all of it. It's just simply impossible. I finally finished watching Outer Range, yeah, that started really strong. I thought it kind of fell apart. I thought it kind of came off the track there a little bit. Um, but I was really into it the first few episodes. Anyway, and there's a lot of great TV out there that I haven't even gotten around to start watching yet. Because there is so much out there. But hey, listen, if you'd rather have the problem that there's too much good stuff to keep up with or there's not enough good stuff to watch, I'll take the there's too much stuff to watch as a problem any day of the week, Casey. At, le at least I would. All right, next up. Mark Netto writes, Christopher Walken in Dune. Yeah, for those of you who might have missed it, they announced that Christopher Walken will be in Dune 2 playing the Emperor of the Universe. Uh, he's going to be playing, um, oh, why am I freezing on her name? Florence Pugh's father. That's right, Florence Pugh is playing the uh, the princess. Right now, the world belongs to Florence Pugh. And uh, Christopher Walken will be playing the dad. It's exciting. Anyway, needs more cowbell, baby. And I found that Strange New Worlds is doing a decent job. I like the third episode. Can't wait for Lightyear. I'll tell you what, straight up, I love Strange New Worlds so far. I absolutely love it. I think, you know, I'll say something. First three episodes in, this is a better show than Star Trek The Next Generation was. Three episodes in. Now, Star Trek The Next Generation didn't really start getting good until like season two. But if, if I wanted to compare it on a where are they so far, I'd say three episodes in, Strange New World is 
better than Star Trek The Next Generation. I've been loving it so far, but, uh, you know, that's just me. But anyway, yes, I also cannot wait for Lightyear. Again, they showed us the first 30 minutes of Lightyear at CinemaCon. And for all I know, maybe the next hour and 20 minutes after that are pure garbage. But based on the first 30 minutes, I am predicting that Lightyear will become the fourth animated film in uh, movie history to be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. That, that's how good the first 30 minutes are. So we'll see how that goes. All right, next up we've got... Hey guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Uh, long one. Ike uh, Nooko writes part one of nine. Uh, and Ike sends in like a $20 start. Thank you so much, Ike, for sponsoring us on that level, man. That's really great of you. Let's get through this. Okay. One of nine. Yo, what up, John? Huge fan since 2013. Thank you so much. A big, big pet peeve of mine recently has been the huge backlash on Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, not on the controversial casting, but in how some perceived its premise to be morally irresponsible to its subject matter. I don't mind people being uncomfortable with its premise for personal reasons, like a cancer patient not being okay with watching a comedy, a comedic cancer story like in the movie 5050, or a recovering drug addict not being comfortable with watching Breaking Bad. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Uh, but people criticizing the creative team behind the film and the overall story as morally irresponsible for for wanting to for wanting to explore such a premise and ultimately a blatant disrespect to mental health is misguided at best and morally inconsistent to me the movie explores how his actions are unquestionably wrong by showing how his guilt burdens his anxiety and his relationships and literally shows him getting shunned and outcasted after he tells the truth to the family of the victim and his school. Uh, yet people ignored all that or prejudged the movie just to claim that the movie sends a wrong message in showing its main character getting rewarded for bad behavior over such a sensitive subject matter related to mental health by exploiting grief. Um, yet those same people will praise The Wire, even though the lead detective cheats on his wife, took the dead bodies of homeless men and desecrates them to frame someone else and gain and game the legal system and literally gets celebrated as a hero cop in the final episode or praise the Sopranos, even though they call minority racial slurs, cheat on their wives and physically abuse them, but get rewarded with money for and sex for bad behavior or praise Game of Thrones, even though they have a newborn baby getting eaten by dogs. Uh, no problem with people who disagree with my take on Dear Evan Hansen. I just want people to be consistent when they get on their moral high ground and start indicting others based on their morality. All this coming from someone who has a connection to mental health. Uh, sorry for the long message. I'm just curious on your and the community's take on this topic. Thanks and appreciate all that you do. All right, Ike, thank you so much for sending that in. And listen, this is a topic I have spoken about a number of times over the years. It drives me crazy when I hear people say 
That movie sends the wrong message. I'm sorry. Are movies not supposed to be stories? And is it not up to you as the individual viewer to glean whatever the message in the movie is for you? The movies are not there to tell us positive messages. I mean, some movies do deliver positive messages. And when they do, if they work, great. Some movies deliver cautionary messages. And if they work and it makes a great movie, great. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Telling a story is not sending a message. All right. Here's the example I always go back to because I think this is the perfect example. Take the great Clint Eastwood's movie, Million Dollar Baby, right? Which I didn't win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. I can't, it won a bunch of Academy Awards. I can't remember if it won Best Picture or not. But take that movie, for example. In that movie, Clint Eastwood is telling a story about a guy. They never say this man, the, the guy also played by Clint Eastwood, and Clint Eastwood is also the director, obviously. They never say in this movie, this man that Clint Eastwood is playing is the benchmark of morality. What he does is only good things, and he would never do bad things. Like, that's not, that's not reality. That's not storytelling. They just tell the story of this guy, right? For all the good and bad in him, for all the right decisions and wrong decisions he makes, the stories about this guy and following him and looking at the choices that this character makes. Not choices that you should make or I should make. It's just looking at the choices that he makes. Now, I remember this because it caused a bit of an upstir. Because at the end of Million Dollar Baby, and I'm going to reveal the ending, but the movie's so old, if you haven't watched it by now, you're not interested in it. So the, basically the movie ends where the girl he's been training suffers a horrific injury and she's going to be paralyzed. And she's a boxer. She's going to be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of her life. And in the hospital, she begs him to help her kill herself. She begs him to help her end her own life. He doesn't want to, but she insists. She begs him. Now, he's, this character, this fictional character, is faced with a dilemma. He doesn't want her to die. He doesn't want to help her, but he wants to respect her wishes. She's obviously miserable, and she is begging him to do this for her. Now, in the movie, this fictional character makes the decision to help her end her own life. Okay? A fictional make-believe character who does not really exist makes the decision to help her. Now, it should be noted that as the movie ends, there's no big screen comes up with the words, this should teach all of you a lesson, that you should help people commit suicide if they're paralyzed. The movie never says that. It's just a story about a fictional character who is faced with a dilemma, and then that character made a certain decision. It wasn't telling you what's right or wrong. It wasn't telling me what's right or wrong. You may have thought what he did was right. You may have thought what he did was wrong, but that's up for you to glean and interpret. The point is, after that movie came out, a lot of people were very pissed off at Clint Eastwood. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there was even a picket and protest outside of the Academy Awards where he was nominated for a bunch of awards saying, you know, that Clint Eastwood thinks handicapped people should be put to death and, and stuff like that. And it's like, no, he's a storyteller telling a story about a fictional character that doesn't really exist, and these are the choices that that character made. Movies should never be made by, well, make sure the good guys only make good decisions and bad guys only make bad decisions. No, that's, yeah, if you're going to make a movie for four-year-olds, fine. But, yeah, I, I don't know about you, but I instantly tune out any criticism of a movie that says, well, they're sending the wrong message. If you're worried about that, like, are you basically saying that human beings don't have the capacity to interpret what they see happening? Because that's real life, folks. It's real life. And you may like or not like a certain movie, depending on what the characters do and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's normal. Like, we may like characters, we may not like characters, we may get attached to a story, we may not get attached to a story, and that's all fine. But 
This whole thing about it's sending the wrong message, I personally tune somebody out once they say that. I just tune them out. Uh, that's just me. So I get where you're coming from on that. And uh, I agree with your frustration on it too, because to me, it's that's just not a good place to start a conversation about a fictional story. You know, a fictional story. Anyway, that's just me. Okay, next up, we've got uh, Jerome who writes, could Doctor Strange have cut off Thanos' hand with a portal like Wong did with Cull Obsidian? And in What If Ultron cut Thanos in half with an energy beam? So despite his invulnerability, it could have worked unless Strange did try in some scenarios. We'll never know. It may have worked on Thanos. It may not have worked at Thanos. And I think at some point he wasn't even, I don't think he was even involved in the fight at that point when they actually had him... Um, uh, restrained for that part, right? I don't think he was involved with the fight at that point. So whether it could have or couldn't have, we'll never know. We'll, we'll just have to see. All right, next up, Scott Brown writes, uh, since you enjoyed Winning Time, I recommend a documentary called Basketball, A Love Story on Hulu. It's narrated by Chadwick Boseman, and it's one of the best docs I've ever seen. It goes through the entire history of basketball, including all the NBA rivalries. Oh, that sounds interesting. Now, unless it starts with the fact that basketball was created by a Canadian in Canada, then I'm not interested in this fake documentary. But if it covers that part, I'll be interested in it. I know I've heard of this before, never seen it myself. I think someday, Scott, I will sit down and give it a watch. Thanks for the recommendation, man. All right, next up. Shook Nasty writes, do you like ST4? I have no idea what that is. Having move, having movie long episode lengths. And do you think other streaming services will start like Moon Knight in particular could have benefited greatly from longer episode lengths? Um, I don't know what ST4 is. Uh, look, all I know is uh, any movie and it go, this goes for TV shows as well. Every movie and TV show has a right length for it. Right. There's no such thing as like two hours and five minutes is the right length for a movie. No, that's not true. Some movies should be a little bit shorter than that. Some movies should be a little bit longer than that. It all depends on what the right time for that individual movie is. And I think the true is same as well for um, for uh, television shows as well. There's the right length for it. I've just been frustrated with the Disney Plus ones because aside from WandaVision, I really feel like they never get it right. Even with the the Disney Plus Marvel shows that I've enjoyed, I feel like they've never gotten the length right, either of the number of episodes or the length of the episodes or anything like that. And I hope that's something they get better at. All right. Stay sweaty for Schnepp writes. Over or under 30% that James Earl Jones will reprise the voice of Darth Vader for the Obi-Wan series. Hashtag stay sweaty. I believe I heard. Now, I, I could be wrong about this. But I think I heard he's not doing the voice of Vader in Obi-Wan. I think he is now retired from doing the voice of Vader. I might be wrong about that, but maybe not. And you know, it's perfectly fine. James Earl Jones has served us, the fan community, doing the voice of Vader for decades and decades and decades and decades. Um, it, it's He's well earned being able to retire from it now. And there's a lot, like, I've watched some video games and stuff like that where there's the voice of Vader and it's not done by James Earl Jones and it sounds pretty damn good. So I am okay if they move on from him, but I believe I heard he's retired from it now. Again, don't take that to the bank. I might be wrong about that. So I'm going to say under 30%. All right, next up, Captain Hawkeye Pierce writes a little bit of mash there for you, I think. Uh, will you guys be doing a movie club for Logan at some point in the future? Yes. Um, I don't know how much longer we'll be doing movie club, but we're going to be doing at least four five or six more of them. And Logan, which I believe is a top three greatest comic book movie of all time, that is definitely one we are going to do. Thanks for asking, Captain Hawkeye. All right, next up. Jerome writes, uh, is there anything in the Lord of the Rings books that says all the people in Middle Earth are white since Tolkien based his Middle Earth on European mythology and the argument is Rings of Power is being historically inaccurate with its casting? Your thoughts? Yeah, I'll tell you what, Jerome, uh, and, and I know... I know you agree with me on this. That is one of the most ass fucking stupid things I have ever heard in my life. Like when I see people complain about, why is that elf black? It's like, oh my fucking God, are really people this stupid? Anyway, um, yeah, no, as far as I know, no, no, granted, it's been a beat since I've read through like the original Lord of the Rings novels and it's been a beat since I, I haven't read uh, the Silmarillion since I was in college. 
but I know I don't believe there was ever reference to white, black, anything like that. Look, and as far as being historically accurate goes, this is a fantasy world, so shut the fuck up. Um, here's the thing with me. Somebody just brought up Logan. Let's use Logan for an example. If if you're crying about why is there black skin on an elf? That's not historically accurate. Um, but you're okay with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and you're okay with Logan. You should just shut the fuck up. Because Logan is supposed to be like four foot ten or five foot one or something like that. Not six plus feet tall like uh, Hugh Jackman is. So if you're okay with that physical difference, that major physical difference, then you should just shut the fuck up about saying, well, wait a minute, these make-believe fairy tale elves shouldn't have dark skin. Just just shut the fuck up. Just shut up. Uh, because you're a moron. Now, anyway, that, that's just, again, it, that's just the thing. Like, it just makes, it's just hilarious how people try to hide the fact that they are so desperately trying to hold on to an agenda of exclusion. They're so desperate to hide it that there's, oh, no, no, it's not that I don't like black people. It's just that, you know, historically speaking, elves are supposed, oh, yeah, how, how are you with Logan? Were you okay with Logan? Oh, I love Logan. Then you should shut up because Wolverine is supposed to be five feet tall. And if you are okay with such a massive physical difference between what that character is supposed to be and the way they did it in the movies, which, by the way, for me, I'm totally okay with it. I love Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, but still. If you're okay with that, then you should shut the fuck up because that's pretty hypocritical. Anyway, that's that's just my my kind of take on that, Jerome, whatever. All right, next up, uh, Connor Thorne writes, I don't know if you guys watched What If, I did, uh, but if you did, I was wondering how old do you think Supreme Strange was since he went back in time to study for what seemed like centuries to defeat the absolute point? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know if it would be years or decades or centuries. I mean, it was it was clearly not a matter of days, or nor was it a matter of weeks. I think it made it pretty clear about that. But I I don't think it got really close. If I remember, I only watched the episode the one time, and I I can't remember them giving anything definitive on that. So I'm I'll be honest with you, I'm not really sure. I didn't think What If was all that great. Now, don't get me wrong, there were certain episodes that were fantastic, like that episode. That episode was great. There's a couple of others that were really good too, and then a couple of them that were like, eh, uh, but that's just kind of my overall take on uh, what if. Okay, uh, next up, Mike Press writes, Hey, John and or Rob, with this Firestarter day and date tripe, will AMC tell Universal that Halloween Ends will be limited one week showing uh, if it's day and date? Or maybe Halloween Ends will be a 45 day window because it should be looked at as a premiere film. Yeah, I have no idea what they're going to do with it. I mean, obviously, the day and date thing was a failed experiment. I mean, badly failed experiment. It costs people at Warner Brothers their jobs. There's a reason why Jason Kalar is no longer the CEO of Warner Brothers. There's a reason why he it was known that he was going to be let go the moment the merger went through. Um, so it doesn't work. I don't know what they're going to do with the next Halloween. I hope they're smart and gives it a premiere. But then again, I just hope that the movie's good. Because the first Halloween movie that came out in 2018, like the first of this series of Halloween movies was so freaking good. I loved that movie. And then the most recent one, I'm not going to lie to you. I was pretty disappointed with it. I did not like the last one. So I really hope they go out with a big bang on this one. And uh, yeah, and I hope it gets a proper theatrical release like I believe it deserves. All right. Final question we're going to do today, guys, and then we're out of time. Uh, this one comes to us from Samir Durrani who writes, my favorite aspect of going to a view cinema in the UK is seeing its own ad played before each movie starring John Boyega. It's dynamic and immersive with a few Easter eggs. It gets me so excited and puts a smile on my face. Uh, feel bad that AMC's isn't as good. Uh, again, hey, listen, again, Samir, if you like that bullshit, more power to you. God bless. If it works for you, it works for you. And that's the important thing. Showing a commercial for a place you're already sitting while the movie was supposed to start 25 minutes ago, to me, in no way can be looked at as a good thing. But hey, listen, if it works for you, it works for you, and that's great. All right, guys, that'll do it 
for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for being here, making this show a part of your day. Big thank you to all of you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because it gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the John Campy channel, thank you guys so much for your support. Don't forget the John Campy Show returns tomorrow uh, here on the show. We hope you guys will come and join us for that. That is at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you guys figure out whatever that is in your particular time zone. And we look forward to seeing you there. Okay, guys, that'll do it for me. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.